Romans 15. Uh, I lost the whole book. If you book. lost Romans, that's bad. Right, that's we good. Good. All right, <laughs> welcome, <laughs> Internet <laughs> friends, <laughs> uh, Harvest family, to Romans Bible study. Um, if you did not know, uh, this is our last Bible study for this chunk. We usually do a chunk in the fall, winter, and spring, uh, and then do something a little bit different in the summertime. So we are wrapping up Romans tonight, um, June, July, August, September. Uh, Pastor Kim and I are going to do a Facebook Live we call it a Wednesday Word, and we're going to talk about relationships and how to build healthy relationships, and I'm, I'm very excited for that because it's stuff we all need, um, but it's, it's just kind of a nice nook to put it in, so to speak. And then in the fall, we just started talking about this the last few weeks, 1 Corinthians. I'm like, wow, so we're intending to just keep on moving through the New Testament yep. and do some great teaching. So June 12th is that, and actually I checked the calendar today. It's always second Wednesdays is when we'll be on Facebook Live. Um, Pastor Kim and I from our house talking about relationships, and we'll put dates on Facebook and announce it in church, put it in the bulletin, that kind of thing. So Romans 15 with one little piece of chapter 16 is what we're going to do tonight to wrap things up. And I'm going to follow the blocking of the New Living Translation. I think the Passion had one more break, but yeah. just made it an awfully small. So we're going to start with verse 1 and read through verse 13. We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must, we must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't help live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O oh God, have fallen on me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. To teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God, who gives us patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews, to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came so that the Gentiles may give glory to God for his mercies to them. That is what the psalmist. psalmist meant when he wrote, For this I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. And in another place it is written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. And yet again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you people of the earth. And in another place, Isaiah said, The heir to David's throne will come, and he will rule over the Gentiles. They will place their hope on him. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with the confidence, hope, confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Cool. Thank, Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Yes. Good job. I mentioned in my email and Facebook posts there was some hope, joy, and peace um, nuggets surprises. I can't remember what phrase I used in the email. Um, but just some, some neat little things about that in the midst of this passage on unity. It's continuing that theme from 14 and, um, and then the inclusion of the Gentiles. So, What do we see in the first 13? I, I, I pulled out just, I mean, just what you just said. I'm, I was reading it this week and I'm going, man, I, I really feel like God's saying something about unity. It seems to be all over the place, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then just that, uh, that concept I brought Sunday that I and I never really thought about it before until I started really started digging into it. But the, the the spiritual maturity is linked in with with that unity, mm -hmm. you know. And this first verse in the Passion really kind of highlights that, and it says those who are mature in their faith can easily be recognized. For they don't live to please themselves, but have learned to patiently embrace others in their immaturity. And, and it's just that concept of, you know, it's not I, 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 I anymore. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the, that can't happen if you don't have unity and community. If you're not coming to church, if you're not plugged into a community, there isn't anybody else but I. <laughs> you know what I mean? So how, how do you develop that? Yeah. 
how do you mature spiritually like that? And if so, you know, I'm just reading this. I'm, I'm just going, wow. I, I, you know, I just mm-hmm. never saw that before. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like in this season, just God seems to keep hammering, at least for me, this unity, you know, um, and, and just the church coming together and standing together and, mm-hmm. you know, the body of Christ and all these concepts, I'm just seeing them cropping up all over the place. Mm-hmm. Love your neighbor and treat others the way you want to be treated, and meeting them where they are, where you don't be disrespectful, like we talked about last week. Mm-hmm. You know, if this one wants to eat meat and this one doesn't want to eat meat, and honor where they are, yep. and help each other to grow. Yeah, it, it doesn't say those who are mature in their faith will be easily recognized because they'll have a label with a title on their Bible. <laughs> Or right. they'll wear some spiritual big, shirt. A big C on their chest or right. something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With a cape. And, yeah. and, then, and then again, you, you know, where does that unity come from? Verse 5, it is, Now may God, the source of great endurance and comfort, grace you with unity among yourselves, which flows from your relationship with Jesus, the anointed one. Mm-hmm. Plus there's strength in numbers, and God knowing the end from the beginning knew what the fledgling church was going to face, and the only way they were going to get through it was with the level of togetherness. Yeah. Well, this really challenged me because the thing that he says is the mark that you'll recognize mature Christians by is they don't live to please themselves. Okay? And, and Kim has said many times, if you want to deal with selfishness in your life, have a baby. Yeah. Who would have put that? Yeah. There, there is nothing like having a 24-7, completely dependent, needy person who usually can communicate their need to you, um, especially with our first. I remember going, I don't know what else to do. We fed her, we changed her, we broke her, we walked her. I don't know why she won't settle down. We had to let her do baby aerobics every night, is what we call it. Just put her in the crib, walk away after you did all the stuff, um, and then you get better at it. But um, to patiently embrace others in their immaturity, wow. You know, that's a challenge, and it, it challenges me for the idea of that being how we recognize mature Christians. Um, here it is from the message, and again, it's just a different way of saying the same thing. Those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter mm. and not just do what is most convenient for us. Strength is for service, not status. Mm. Mm. Yes. Amen. Each of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and this idea, uh, Kim and I were talking about this recently, of uh, giving care with kindness. <coughs> um, and you just don't realize how challenging that can be. Yes. You know, it, it's easy to you know, <coughs> do a little dab of good work. But when the proportions shift radically, and again, our family is experiencing that pretty significantly, um, it, it's challenging. It's just really challenging. And for that to be, again, kind of the emblem or the badge that you recognize mature Christians by, it, it's just, it, it's, you know, challenging me. It's kind of in my face a little bit to go, okay. And again, when it keeps repeating itself, and Romans 12, which we've been unpacking on Sundays, we'll wrap that this week, continues to echo the other parts. It's like, wow, God is repeating himself. God is driving this issue. Um, You know, we should be tuning in. And and again, for us as a church, I I have learned this reality. It starts with me. I mean, if I'm the senior leader, it starts with me. You know, three of the people on this couch have the title pastor. It starts with us. It starts from the head down. And I'm just going, whoa. And <laughs> I'm dealing with family care for two parents. Alan has been dealing with family care for two fathers. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's like, uh, you know, I'm leaving the office today and going, I got to go take my dad to the doctor. I think you know about that. <laughs> and it's like, and then it turned into, well, he hasn't put gas in his car because he's not driving. Well, he's, he's, you know, having this issue. Hi, dad, if you're listening. Um, where <laughs> He's on here. He, he, oh, okay. Well, here we go. This is what happens when you have a relationship with a pastor. They preach about your issues. Yeah. Ask my kids. Um, and so I had the, just like the bed frame, mm-hmm. I realized, oh, my dad's not using his bed because the bed's too high. 
And then the, the therapists that come in the house say, well, how about this one? This one's low. It's good. And I went, wait a minute. If we took the frame off of his, it would be about the same height. I brought a tape measure, and it was the exact same height. So we pulled the frame out, and it's like, oh, now it's low. Easier you can get for in and him out to get it. in and out of. So for some reason, I'm going, why, why are we confused about paying the guy who cuts the grass? And I realized, he doesn't have any more cash in the house. Uh -huh. He needs to go to the bank to get some cash. And you, you know, the account is overflowing. Don't worry, I won't mention how much money you have, Dad. But he's <laughs> got a lot of money. Um, <laughs> for for the average person who's very well funded in retirement. And I realized, oh, he doesn't have any cash in the house. So I said, Dad, you want to go to the bank today? He said, uh, yeah. I said, well, I'm thinking, and, and I explained it all, and he went, well, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, how did we do it? Okay, we go in, you use your debit card, tell them what you want. And I was like, cool, well, the problem solved. Nobody explained it. I just saw the problem and went, Lord, I need help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was able to do that and be happy about it. But yeah, stuff just compounds. Mm -hmm. Nothing moves fast. Everything is sticky. You can't extract it. Like all over again. Oh, my. <laughs> then I, t I took him home and, and the neighbor's in the house. And I'm like, I got to go. I got to go back to work. <laughs> it's nice to see you. <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> so it's funny. But um, yeah, just wherever you're at, Whatever you're dealing with, if I can try to serve this up and offer it to those here and those connecting with us on Facebook, let God work in your circumstances. You know, I've, I've really for the last season of time since my dad got sick, I've been going, Lord, I should, I should be really praying and read my Bible and all this. And God's like, your life is a prayer lab right now. So let's just talk about that. I got plenty of leverage in your life right now. Let's just talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, when what we're studying Wednesday, Sunday backs that up, I, I, God's talking to where I'm at. It's good stuff. There's a part about working together and being respectful. Sometimes when you're, especially in group activities, People do things the way they do things, and if you do it different from me, that doesn't make you wrong. Right, that's true. <laughs> it just means it's different, and yes. sometimes you gotta shut up and back up and just say, they just do it different. That's and right. They put the forks on the right instead of on the left. <laughs> it's not the end of the world, <laughs> you know? But people oh, yeah. get very wrapped up in these yes. little minutia things, yes. right? and have right. major schisms and palpitations over it, oh, right? Yeah. And that's it's true. It's just different, that's yeah. all. It's just different. Yeah. 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 And some of us have an easier time with that than others. So that'll, that'll push our buttons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm that, so. naturally yes. I'm that everything is just so. And I came from a family of everything is just so. And Kim is not like that. Um, <laughs> nope. She does it different every time, new and creative. Let's, let's put them on I the just, top. Let's I just start doing bottom. stuff and figure out as I go. But, the, but when you're under the kind of pressure we're under, it'll also push other things. I, I think there are... There are times where when you serve, you expect to be repaid in your love language. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm trying not to, you know. That happens in our house. My, my son gets mad because I, I need him to cut more. Right. No, I'm going to cut. Mm -hmm. No, you don't need, need all cutting, not just. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I'm watching that and going, oh no, all this will squeeze all of yeah. us. So <laughs> yeah, sure. Somebody does it different. I, you know, I remember when we had one child and ended up having a second one while we lived with my parents for a little season. I was kind of in a career change, raising support and ministry and left engineering. And I, I can't remember if I came home from something or whatever, but there's Kim in tears and I'm like, what's going on? She's like, I loaded the dishwasher wrong and your mother let me have it. And I was like, wow, I, I can see both those things. I can see Kim loading the dishwasher creatively and my mother going, why are you doing it that way? Oh, <laughs> and, and going, this is a collision because I'm wired like my mom and I love her enough to go, okay, does where the forks go really matter? Yeah, that, that would have been the... <laughs> are we going to have a fight over this? In my house with my kids, I gave them a rag and a bucket and some soap and said, go clean some." <laughs> That's how we did chores, you know. Go clean something, and I'll tell you when you're done. Cindy, so college. We were years ago when we lived in the greenhouse, and my my older two were were young. Um, and of course, they we had a two story, and then some pictures 
going up on the wall, going up the stairs there. And Cindy used to get so mad because those pictures would always be tilted. Ah! And she'd get straight. And I, I came walking in from the dining room. I, was, I think I, was, I had something in my hand. I was munching on something. And I came walking into the dining room, into the living room. The living room is kind of connected. That's where the stairs are. And so my son was going up. So the stairs went up like three stairs, and then it turned. It went up like halfway, landing, and then it turned again, right? So he had his back to me. And I, I'm looking at him, and he goes up, and he goes up, goes up, stops where, the stair, where the, that picture was, and he goes, it pushes a little bit. It starts going on. I go, wait a minute. And he goes, like this. And I, I said, how long have you been doing that? And he goes, uh, not, not long. And then he took off. I said, you've been doing that for years, boy. <laughs> Just to get his mother's goat. Just bugging his mom. <laughs> I, I don't want to you know, mention to anybody's name, but was that Richie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have watched Richie here in church start at Sydney, and I'm like, Dude, you're a yeah. brave man. He's like, oh, no, it's fun. He even named it. He calls it poking the bear. And I'm like, well, why would you poke a bear? That, that makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. How is that fun? <laughs> Entertaining. Especially now that he's way bigger than she is. Oh, he's yeah. probably having a blast. Yeah. Uh, now he's got his own bear in the house. You know, yeah. So. yeah. Oh, yeah. It does change. You go, okay, I love this woman. I want her to stay with me the rest of our lives. I, I I better be careful how much I poke, mm. as opposed to a mom where you go, no, I'm leaving. I can poke you now. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Mom's going to love you anyway. That's yes, right. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I'm in that situation now as an only child where I'm like, I, I could do just about anything. And she'd be like, that's my son. That's my only son. Mm. Like, okay. I will minister. His favorite line was, I'm the only child, and I'm not the favorite. <laughs> that's fine. It's a beautiful glass. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice. Shiny, shiny. All right. Anything else in these first 13? Uh, something just, I mean, just, you know, I was just reminded that, I don't know if anybody needed to hear this, but us Gentiles were not, you know, the second choice. It was always mm -hmm. God's plan to include everyone in, mm -hmm. in, in the planet. And you, you look at that, the second one he quotes is from Deuteronomy. So you're, you're, that's going way back. Okay. Um, so again, it wasn't it wasn't a new idea. It wasn't just because you know God's plan was that He loved everyone, and He was in, you know always had the plan to include include us. Yes, He did. Absolutely. Well, here's those nuggets that just jumped out at me, and sometimes I think you need to read the Bible this way that if there's something in the middle of a verse or even in the middle of a sentence you just go wow that's fantastic don't be afraid to kind of clip what's around it and pull it out we always need to study the scripture in context and understand what's happening but when something really is fantastic just grab hold of it um, you know don't don't get cluttered with everything else um, verse 4 said the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be filled. And then verse 5, God gives this patience and encouragement. So let's draw from those things. And down in verse 13, God is the source of hope. And Paul prays that he will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I was just so impacted that hope and encouragement and joy you know, are, are all these things kind of mixed into this picking of the Gentiles and just go, I could use some hope. And, and the trigger for that from the loading dock is trust. Yeah. Which yeah. this verse may show up in a couple of weeks. Yeah. When we <laughs> trust him, then we, then we uh, <coughs> see those things move off the loading dock for us. Um, yeah, because I, I think we're in a place right now, again, some of this is in my life, but I, I see where the body of Christ is at, that we need encouragement, we need hope, we need joy, we need peace, and we need trust. Um, John Eldridge, who I just keep quoting all the time, because his last two books literally changed my life and got me through the pandemic. There, I had a couple of life preservers, and his, his resilient book was one of them. And, um, and he talks about, you know, giving, he has his prayer, Lord, I give everyone and everything to you. Everyone mm. and everything mm. to you. 
and I leave it there. And he said, if you walk out, and on the way out you start to worry about something, you didn't leave it. Wow. And, and he, he calls this concept benevolent detachment, where you can't save the world, you can't carry the world. You were never meant to. When you see a need, when, when something's going on in your life, or your family, or your circle of friends, whatever, and you see the need and you realize you can't meet it, you take it to him. And you say, Lord, I give it to you. And, and that trust releases those things. Because I have some gifts. I'm a great problem solver. Um, I love troubleshooting and writing computer code and figuring out what the problem is. And I have some situations in my life that my brain is never going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I have begun to realize that there's times where the hamster on the wheel will just work itself to death mm -hmm. until I go, wait a minute. This problem, like the bed frame, this problem, like the, oh, you need some cash to pay the grass cutter. My brain can find those solutions. Your complete healing at 84 years old, which is only going to come in heaven. My brain is never going to manifest that. And so you, you have to be able to go, yep, let me work on this. Let me serve. Let me serve with kindness over here. I need to trust. I just need to trust God. And all of us have problems like that. We have things that are assigned to us that we can use our gifts for. We can ask God for wisdom. We can see him solved. And then we got other ones that we go, too big for me. Mm. I just need to trust. I need to give it to God and say, Lord, you got to do what's there. I'll pray whatever you give me to pray. I'll serve however you call me to serve. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, this is bigger than me. I trust you with it. Mm. And I give it to you. Amen. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I'm, I'm going to be talking about trust and I'm end up seeing it all over the place now. <laughs> <laughs> so June 2nd, Who Can You Trust? is my working title for <laughs> Alan's message. <laughs> yes. But I'm very much looking forward to it. I've never been a good title person. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we're a good team with that. I'll say, title. I don't know what the title is, but it's kind of about this and about this and about this. I'm going, oh, I can pull a title out of that. <laughs> we'll work together on this. <coughs> so some great stuff coming out Tag of Proverbs. team preaching. Yeah, right here live on our stage. <laughs> there you go. Anything else in those first 13? Anything from the interwebs? Uh, Is our feed working tonight? Yep. Yeah. Ralph's working. I don't think he'll be able to join us. Oh, man. Come on, Ralph. Get your priorities together. <laughs> Sorry. All right. This just came through the computer. <laughs> directly. Oh! <out. laughs> These are my priorities, Tom. Okay, okay. Uh, let's read the next chunk then. The third chunk in this chapter is really kind of a travel log. Um, it's, it's with the reason we're not reading 16 is it's just greetings, but we'll read the good stuff. So let's do 14 through 22. I am fully convinced, my dear brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness. You know these things so well that you can teach each other all about them. Even so, I have been bold enough to write about some of these points, knowing that all you need is this reminder. For by God's grace, I am a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. I bring you the good news so that I might present you as soon what? you as an acceptable oh, present you as an acceptable offering to God, made holy by the Holy Spirit. So I have reason to be enthusiastic yeah. about all Christ Jesus has done through me and my service to God. Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by, by the way. I worked among them. They, are, they were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Jerusalem. Illyricium. My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard. Rather than where a church has already been started by somewhere, someone else, I have been following the plan spoken of in the scriptures where it says, those who have never been told about him will see, and those who have never heard of him will understand. Mm. In fact, my visit to you has been delayed so long because I have been preaching in these places. Illyricum was my guess. But now they have um, audio Bibles on the Bible app. And you just push it and it'll read it for you. Yes, wow. it will. That's true. See, Sam, you, you could be replaced by AI. 
but we like you better. <laughs> and I can't someone's chest. <laughs> That's right. I, I prefer to say Croatia. There you go. Oh there you go. <laughs> I know where Croatia is. It's on the eastern side of that body of water, across from the um, Adriatic Sea. What is that place? I said, almost said Naples. It's not Naples. Venice. 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 There you go. Okay. I've traveled there via television, never in person. Oh, we went for a week on our honeymoon. Oh my! Oh, nice. Where's your honeymoon? Oh, oh my gosh! Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to go to Venice and just anytime we we were to Europe one time. I just want to sit, watch the world go by. And eat. Go on Labor Day weekend time. Venice reenacts its marriage to the sea and oh, there's gondola wow. races on the Grand wow. Canal. So that's where you want to sit and eat and have your Prosecco and watch the gondola races wow. and just be Venetian for a few hours. Yeah. It's wonderful. That's yeah. what that's when we were there. Wow. That's wow. nice. We did a little bit of that on the Champs Elysees and is wow. the main drag in Paris mm -hmm. and just sat there and watched the world go by and then I went why did we do this after we went to Versailles? Mm. It's like we were exhausted, we were dirty, we had been out all day long. It's like we should have spent all day right here at this table. <laughs> so if we are ever, ever able to go back. croissants, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, 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 we've talked about going back to Paris and it's like, no, 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 I'm just going to sit. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to find a chair in a cafe and park for the day. So there's mm. enough to look at. It. Anyway. Illyricum, yeah, Croatia. There we go. Back to that. <laughs> Jen Saki, circling back. <laughs> Not gin and Saki. Not gin and Saki. No. <laughs> Saki martinis. I mixed them the wrong way. <laughs> well, Jen Saki is a former <laughs> spokesperson for President Biden, and she loved to say when, when the conversation yeah. would get back, circling back. Um, wow. And so it's become a tag word for Kim and I. Jen Saki. You, you ran a rabbit trail there, your ADD kicked in. Okay. Uh, two, two themes jumped out at me in, in these scriptures. Uh, the first one was um, just that partnership with Christ, uh, mm -hmm. especially verse 17 in the passage. Says, it's through my union with Jesus Christ that I enjoy an enthusiasm mm -hmm. and confidence in my ministry. Um, yes. And then, again, just that thread throughout this thing of, you know, just staying humble in what you're doing. Yeah. And, and uh, you can see that, that Paul's... <coughs> At this point in his in, in, in his ministry, you, you can tell you know it, it, it's. I don't think it was blind to him or to anybody else that there was a, a, a huge. Uh, his ministry had really exploded at this point. I think that there was no nobody could say you're, you, what you're doing isn't doing any work or isn't yeah. doing any good. Yeah. Um, so there was definitely, I think. A, a, a potential to be able to say, look at all that, that I have done. <clears throat> and yet instead, he says, I, nothing I did, it's all through the power of Jesus and through mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit that these people have been, been brought in. I'm just, you know, partnering with, with, with Jesus and going where he says and, and preaching about the good and telling about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that, that thread of humility through this, that, especially when you consider the timing of this, the writing of this. I mean, you know, he's already been Ephesus and the, all these other places and, and you know I don't think anybody could, could not look back just even in, in, in that time period and not see the impact that he made mm -hmm. you know obviously not knowing the impact he would have even later and you know what how much what percentage of the New Testament is accredited to Paul my goodness yeah. Yeah. you know um, huge uh, but again there's that there's that humbleness mm -hmm. Yeah, I really got struck in a couple of the chapter 12 messages. He's hammering this, you know. I mean, he really is, and, and we need to hear it. And again, we, we live in an atmosphere of arrogance um, and elitism, and, and Paul would have been elite, you know, by any spiritual standard, but, you know, it, it wasn't me. It was him working through me. <laughs> How about this statement out of the Passion? I know that each of you is stuffed full of God's goodness. Mm. <laughs> Way to put it. <laughs> and, and here's Jack Hayford's definition for that word goodness. Kindness in an actual manifestation. Virtue equipped for action. Mm. A bountiful press, um, propensity both to will and to do what is good. Intrinsic goodness producing a generosity and a godlike state of being. 
This word is a rare word that combines being good and doing good. And I, I think that, again, in the spirit of offering care with kindness, um, is not only being good, but doing good. And, and keeping both things. That sometimes it's easy to be nice in theory when you never get your hands dirty. And sometimes it's easy to lose patience um, Paul talked about if, if your gift is caring for others, you know, keep your patience. Don't don't let it drag you down. Keep a smile on your face. Um, and both those things simultaneously, um, being good and doing good can be real challenging. But that you're stuffed full of God's goodness. <laughs> I'm imagining like you know, a manicotti or something that's just breaking. <laughs> There's that encouragement too that you know, we all need. Mm-hmm. The other thing right there is he says, you know these things so well you can teach each other about them. Yes. That word teach means exhort or counsel. Christians are often the best counselors for one another, especially when they understand the will of God is taught in the scripture and are able to apply the scripture rightly to life. And again, in, in the idea of unity and, and being with other Christians, I think it's just huge that we have enough of the word in us that we can offer that to somebody else. Mm. You know, there, there are times that, again, the current situation I find myself in, that I've probably asked Kim on a regular basis, are we hitting the mark? Are we doing the right thing? You know, are, are we here? You know, is there some adjustment to have? It's so difficult to navigate. And just that confirmation of somebody else or the adjustment or the, hey, maybe you want to, you know, take this this direction a little bit or add this other piece to it mm. um, that we can teach one another because we're stuffed full of God's goodness <laughs> that you're richly supplied with all kinds of revelation knowledge that you are empowered to effectively instruct one another um, or warn or teach our alternate translations and that challenges me to be mm -hmm. full of God's word enough to be able to genuinely teach or counsel, or, or you know, whatever it is that comes up to be able to speak to. Mm. And sometimes you teach more by action and activity, not in words, mm. and you find energized in a peace and service. It might be exhausting work, but you you're not tired until you stop and go home. You know, <laughs> and then the body goes, "What did you do to me today?" <laughs> you know, but the whole time you're doing it, that yes. doesn't even come up. Yes. As, the, the physical strenuousness of whatever activity you've been up to. Yeah. You know, I just find that's a, that's a sustaining mm -hmm. faith in that whatever. It just lets you be a, a better, a nice example mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. being good to people is like. Well, I think sometimes you're doing that, again, in partnership with the Lord mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit's there empowering you. Yeah, you couldn't do it without them. <laughs> and then the service ends and the power lifts and you go, oh, I mean... Pretty much every Sunday of my adult life has been like that, that I've, I've staggered home. And now I say all the time, I, I really do feel bad for my kids. They got the worst of me pretty much every Sunday afternoon because you just poured out, mm -hmm. you know, literally poured out. And so... Um, it's basic physiology. You used up all your adrenaline. You right. just got to recharge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we have really learned. Uh, again, I'm so thankful for Kim. Um, Dr. Altshubard Hall. Archibald Hart is a Christian counselor psychiatrist mm -hmm. and he had a fantastic book on adrenaline and stress and the need to allow your adrenal system to reboot um, and that's we have a vacation coming in a couple of weeks and that's one of the things that we're saying to each other is slow everything is going to be slow no schedule Mm -hmm. You know, and quite often I'm like, well, it's, it's about three o'clock. It's time for Kim, Tom and Kim to go eat lunch on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What time is it? Three o'clock. We went one time on our honeymoon actually to Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah. And we must have been on slow Tom and Kim time because we went to eat lunch at three o'clock. Well, nothing was open because they had the window for lunch and the window for dinner. And we were there in between. Right. Thankfully, we found the cafeteria or something. That happens a lot in Europe. Be careful when you travel in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, you got to eat when it's time. Um, or wait till the next time, which is 10 o'clock at night. Right. Who eats dinner at 10 o'clock at night? Wow. <laughs> we, walked, we walked into Indiana, 
Tex-Mex restaurant on Bastille Square at midnight. I was a younger man. Wow. <laughs> and the hostess looked at us and said, two for dinner? And I said, I love this place. <laughs> you walk in and, and the crowd was like shoulder to shoulder out on the square. And I was wow. like, wow, this is nuts. Two for dinner? And, and they sat other people after us. And I was yeah. like, okay. Uh, again, back then I could, you know, stay up that late. Or for some of us, that would have been second dinner. <laughs> second dinner. Well, yeah. I, I don't even remember second what else we had. Yeah. You know, brunch. You know, you got. Well, I tell you what, in, in Paris, they were the best French fries I ever ate. Everything. I mean, we had gyros on the street, mm -hmm. and it was like, how is everything here <laughs> so delicious? <laughs> this is ridiculous. Quality yeah. ingredients. If if, if yeah. money was no object, I would just stay here. But all we've been doing is spending it, and not making any. But yeah, it was amazing. So all that relates, Jensaki. Full of goodness, you are stuffed full of goodness, and so you can teach each other. Yeah. What else do we see in this chunk of scripture? I think his passion for reaching those who have never heard the gospel is just a truly an evangelist heart. Mm -hmm. You know, I um, I can relate to that. I you know, not that I don't love church people, but um, my passion was to go where people don't know about Jesus or haven't accepted Jesus. So that's why I'm working in the field I'm working in, because they don't know. You know, they don't have they really don't have a clue, and they need him desperately. So I thought that was. Interesting what he had to say, but how his passion for it just comes out in this passage. Yeah. I think that's a problem for a society that church attending Christians that are in church groups, mm -hmm. they don't meet non church people. They don't right. know where right. they don't, so right. they don't ever share the word because everybody they know already knows it. Right. And then when they, if they are in a situation like that, they clam up. They know it's just like foreign, and they don't know what to do. Yeah. And, you know. And yeah. There are, there are times you have to actively choose to get outside of those circles. Um, I'm a pastor. I work for a small business where it's pretty much a set group of people. That's it. You know. And it's like uh, I got to push myself to be in other situations and do that. Um, Especially if you're wired like me, where you like the same old group. You know, Kim gets tired of the same old group. She wants new people. Mm -hmm. Well, God put her in a field where if, if somebody is super successful under her teaching and counseling, after 12 weeks, they leave. Mm -hmm. So there's a constant new stream of people. Um, and I, I think you need both things. If you're wired like that, you need to commit to the faithful few who keep showing up all the time which I have a natural appreciation for, but you got to seek out other people. Mm -hmm. you know? I've been afraid, not afraid, but I haven't prayed that prayer to put them in my path. I work with Christians. The majority of our patients are Christians. I can't communicate with them, but they're all deep believers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every staff meeting we pray first, lunch we pray first. And very easy, and it just yep. flows. But I find less fertile ground in the church that I attend. Yeah. But I'm just like, I don't, haven't said that, just put me out there. Put those people in my path, because yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I have anything left to give them at the moment. Yes. You know? <laughs> well, and that's something you have to be honest about, too, is that when, when you've poured out, when the cup's empty, it's empty. Mm -hmm. right, right. So, and, and you need to know where you're called to. Um, you know, I, I love um, the brothers and sisters that I serve with in the city, um, in Unified Seifert, which is mostly other pastors. And that's a great team because everybody is fairly mature and committed and faithful and, and reliable. And we've organized some events and it's like, man, this is easy. And then you go back to your own church and you go, nobody is as committed here <laughs> as that group of pastors as you. Oh, I, I guess it's because they're leaders. But as nice as that is, there's times where I go, harvest is first. You know, I, I wish I could do more of that. And I had a shift of schedule in the last year or so. And we had four prayer meetings. We do have four prayer meetings throughout the city every Wednesday. And I needed to make some quality decisions, and I had to give two of those up. And it's like, man, I would love to hang out with that group, pray with that group. You know, it's like, yeah. But it's like, nope, I've got other stuff I have to do. You have to make those decisions. Because we're all limited. Mm -hmm. 
you know, none of us are infinite. Again, that's that part of that is God speaking to us and going, oh, are you, are you, are you the Savior? Am I in your way here? <laughs> are you the only one that can do that? Yeah. Right. Or God going, you want to just trust me? Give everyone and everything to me? <sighs> Nothing like being reminded that you're just not that powerful or important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or limitless. Right. I think yeah, is the other absolutely. thing. Good, good, good. Well, how about we go ahead, since we have a chunk in 16 to read, let's go ahead and read the rest of chapter 15. Okay. There's a couple names in here, Sam. I apologize oh. in advance. You'll be all right. You will all have 23 to the end. <laughs> but now I have finished my work in these regions, and after all these long years of waiting, I am eager to visit you. I am planning to go to Spain, and when I do, I will stop off in Rome. And after I have enjoyed your fellowship for a little while, you can provide for my journey. But before I go, I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers there. For you see, the believers in Macedonia, Macedonia, and Achaia. Achaia have eagerly taken up the offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. They were glad to do this because they feel Sorry. they owe a real debt to them. Since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers in Jerusalem, they feel the least they can do is return in return is to help them financially. As soon as I deliver this money and have completed this good deed of theirs, I will come to see you on my way to Spain, and I am sure that when I come, Christ will richly bless our time together. Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join in my struggle by, by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love for me, given to you by the Holy Spirit. Pray that I will be rescued from those in Judea who refuse to obey God. Pray also that the believers there will be willing to accept the donation I am, ta I am taking to Jerusalem. Then, by the will of God, I will be able to come to you with a joyful heart, and, be, and we will be an encouragement to each other. And now, may God, who gives us his peace, be with you all. Amen. Amen. He still thinks he's going to Spain. That's so cute. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that same thing. He's making plans. And Man plans his ways. Right. God right. determines his steps. Yep. Yep. What so, do we see in this chunk? All right, a couple of things, but just stick with the part of the scripture first. Um, Oh my! Again, I'm just <laughs> been steeping in this unity thing and the whole body of Christ and how, you know, the finger can't do the work of the tongue and you know, foot, can, you know, <laughs> head can't walk, the feet walk, you know. Isn't that powerful that the head can't say to the feet, "I have no need of you"? You know who the head is? It's Jesus. Uh -huh. Jesus can't say to the callus on the bottom of the foot of the body of Christ, "I don't need you." No. Yeah. And, and in that concept, then you go, you know, some of us are called to go out to some place where they've never heard about Jesus. But the rest of us, you know, this, this verse here and, and the way that the passion puts it, I'm like, yeah, prayer is fight. Yes. And it's at verse 30, it says, I plead with you because of our union with our Lord Jesus Christ to be partners with me yes. in your prayers to God. My dear brothers and sisters in the faith, with the love we share in the Holy Spirit, fight alongside me in prayer. Yes. That it, we're just as important as the other pieces of the body that are called to go out somewhere. Yes. Absolutely. You know, and I, I, I just, and it's one of those things, just another one of those things that slaps you in the face and you go, it's not just, oh, there's nothing left to do but pray. You know, man, we got we to gotta get rid of that mindset, mm -hmm. you know? Um, prayer is powerful. Yeah. Um, and if and if you're not experiencing that, you you, you just need to dig in more. You you just <laughs> we forget we see it when our prayers are answered. We see it when there's a miraculous healing or something, and we're all excited about how powerful prayer is. And then when we're just praying our everyday praying, it's just our everyday praying, and we forget the power that's in it. And then and yeah. how important how much it edifies you. Absolutely. You know, I had a situation I could have gone either way, and it wasn't going to be a good day. And I'm just like. No, 
I'm not going to let you take my joy away. Mm. You know, Holy Spirit, let's get this little mindset turned around here and whatever. And then uh, much better. But I just had this moment. I'm, I'm just going to pray about it. And then there yeah. it was, you know. Yeah. So I could have just been a poopy head and moke and been all pissed off all day to everybody. And, <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, I'm not going to ruin my day. Yeah. You know, so, but we forget when it's just everyday mundane. Five o'clock, time to pray. Eight o'clock, time to pray. And then every little situation, oh my gosh, my dog got sick, pray for me. Oh, my mother's in the hospital, pray for me. And, and we're quick to do that. Right. Yeah. And that's all powerful. That's true. You know, yeah. we get feedback on it, but yeah. the everyday stuff, we don't give it the respect or importance that it needs or deserves. Yeah, I've, this is one that's been haunting me. It's Philippians 4, the don't worry about anything, pray about everything. Um, passage in the passion says tell him every detail of your life and and that's no one should ever say I don't have anything to pray about that's if we're true. supposed to tell him every detail of our lives but he knows. well but he wants to converse about it because when we start to talk to him about it he already knows it's prayers never informing God he already knows it's it's us coming into agreement with him and, and again, I've, I've had significant number of times in recent times where I'm like, Lord, I, I, I wish I was giving you more time and attention. I wish I was reading the Bible more. I wish I was praying more. And God's like, no, no, no. You're living in a prayer laboratory. Tell me the details. Wow. What's going on? Tell me the details of your life. That is your prayer life. And it's just been powerful. And again, I had a couple of situations where I went, why don't we do this? And it solved the problem. And I went, oh. Oh, that's cool. You know, that that's that's neat to suddenly see something that actually works. And <laughs> when your help has been refused over and over and over again <laughs> to see it received and it hits the mark and you go, Oh, okay. That, that's a good thing. So yeah, I mean how how do you pray without ceasing? How do you never stop praying? You pray about all the details of your life. Would you be, you know, worrying about complaining about mumbling under your breath anyway, rest of frack them, you know, flat tire. My, my car is one of those newfangled electric computer chip cars. And um, at one point today, it decided to not accelerate. And it does this when there's a, a, a radical change in temperature. It's like it thinks it knows where to tune the car, but then it doesn't work at this temperature. And I was like, oh. and then God's going, breathe. You know, you call it, a smart car, right? It, it, yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's just the sensors. You know that they got whacked out because the temperature dropped this afternoon. Okay, wow. and then I ended up driving my dad's car to drive him around because we could get it in and out of the garage. And then I got back in the car and the car worked just fine. And I was like, okay, yep, yep. I let a little worry get on my face. I let a little anxiety rise up. Lord, trust. That trust. Lord. You guys got too much money for me. <laughs> the other thing about it was a used car when I bought it. <laughs> the other thing about the prayer that I, 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 I as we're digging and we're talking and I'm just, you know, if your only exposure to prayer is when the pastor prays after service, then then you might have a misconception about what it's all about. Yeah. You know? And if you've never read the Psalms where the psalmist is mad upset, depressed, lonely, and at the end he's praising God. Yeah. That's that's a model of prayer. If you if you think God's not strong enough to have, handle your anger, or if he's not got enough love and compassion to handle your loneliness, then you, you you're not you're not digging into what prayer was meant to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the things I mean, if you've never prayed to God and and I and you right now prayed to Him and told Him how mad you were, He'd be very happy to hear from you right now. That's right. Um, because like Tom was saying earlier, you, you can get that out, and God, prayer has this mystical, mysterious way of God being able to take that out and take that off your shoulders mm -hmm. and replace it with stuff that's so much better. Yeah. Love, peace, joy. You know. Uh, yeah. It's releasing the computer in your brain. Yeah. That's what it's basically doing. Yeah, download all the yeah. stuff that's up in there. Yeah. yeah. Get it out. But if you if you your exposure is prayer has to be this nice and a haughty thing that yeah. like what what the preacher says at the end is that's not I mean that's sure that's a prayer, but that's not all that doesn't encompass everything that we should be 
like Tom says, if, if that's all it is, how do you pray all the time? How do you pray without ceasing? If you can't do it with just that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, John Ortberg, I think the book is The Life You Always Wanted, talking about prayer. One of the things that locks most Christians up is they try to come up with the kinds of prayers they think God wants to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of realizing, oh, what are you thinking about? What are you worried about? What's on your heart? What's on your mind? Yeah. That's the fuel for prayer. That's the stuff That's you should stuff be praying God wants about. to talk to you about. Right, because he has answers or peace where there's no answer or that sifting thing that goes on that you come in upset or anxious or burdened. Psalm 42. Read Psalm 42. And, and if you read it today, you'd go, wow, David needed some Prozac or something. <laughs> <laughs> some, some little bipolar. Um, but yeah, I mean, he literally is saying, all your, you know, all your waves and breakers have rolled over me, God. You, you're drowning me in grief. But by the end, yet will I praise you. Yeah. You know, you, when you process that kind of stuff with God, man, it's just, it, it's like wastewater management, literally. I mean, you just come in, you know, dare I say, full of crap. And, and you just process it, and it comes out sweet at the other end. And you go, how did you do that, Lord? How did you turn me around when I felt so horrible, so mean, so messed up, so you know, resentful? Only God. That's what real prayer is. Mm -hmm. It, it, if, it mm -hmm. changes our soul. If God was the most perfect man on earth, I mean, why are people so angry with him? I mean, I don't get it. Um, I think a lot of times... People, it is amazing, but we've seen it. People blame God for the bad there is. Mm -hmm. this or was, they prayed and asked for some, God something to do something, and, get it. And, uh -huh. it, and it didn't turn out the way they wanted, so yeah. they blame God. Well, and I've, I just saw something the other day that said, sometimes God's answer is yes, sometimes God's answer is no, and, and we don't like that answer, but that's the answer to our prayer. And sometimes the answer is not yet. That's the worst one. <laughs> got to wait. I got to do. Yeah. And maybe the issue is you're not ready to receive the answer to your prayer. I got to change you mm -hmm. so that you can get the answer. And, Can't and, the way answer. and something about that that I wanted to to kind of break open the veil on is God's not upset if you're mad at Him. He's strong enough to take that. Yeah. What breaks His heart is when you're mad at Him and you don't go to Him in prayer and talk to Him about it. Yes. And you just stay mad for no, and, and, and let it fester inside of you. That's the, that's the bad part. Yeah. Deny yourself all that time of good relationship. Well, and, and theologically, um, people want to blame God for the bad that happens. Yeah. Um, and generally when that happens, there isn't a thankfulness for the good. But there's also an understanding that this idea of partnership we talk about a lot at Harvest, God trusted us mm -hmm. to play a role and gave us authority to play a role. You read Genesis 1, God gave Adam and Eve authority and we messed it up and the world's broken and, and we, we call that sin. Sin has entered into the world and messed things up. And it's one of the reasons that I, I don't personally believe that God controls every detail because he gave us the choice and, and we mess some things up. And if God is in control of every detail, he does have some explaining to do because there's a lot of bad in the earth. I saw something, I don't know if this was accurate or not, but um, supposedly there was a college classroom and a professor came in all, all full of himself. Getting Did you see to, it? Getting ready to say that. Yep. Um, well, go ahead. About no, no, you go ahead. If God made evil. Um, if God made everything, didn't God make evil? And that's it. And the student raised his hand and said, well, professor, um, if you talk about light and darkness, there is no thing as measuring darkness. Darkness is just the absence of light. And if you talk about heat and cold, there is no such thing as cold. Cold is just the absence of heat. In the same way, there is no real evil. There is the absence of good. There's absence of God's love. Mm -hmm. And evil is just a word that we came up with to explain it. Yes. So God made light, the absence of it is darkness. He made heat, the absence of it is cold. He made good, the absence of it is evil. And dumbfounded the professor, and it's attributed to Albert Einstein. Of saying that. Yeah, that he's the student that answered the professor back. Mm. And, and that resonates with me to go, yeah, God made it good, 
and, and you we saw everything was good. And we did. We messed it up, and we have the absence of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we want to blame him for the absence of it when it's like, no, no, he, he wants to come. <laughs> I still love I'm going to be too on this one for a while. Um, I want to be stuffed full of God's goodness. I was looking at Italian restaurants. I'm going to take my parents to eat Italian before we go on vacation. And I'm seeing manicottis and I'm seeing cannolis and they're just <laughs> about to burst with the cheese, <laughs> especially because they've got good food photographers, you know. And, and then I'm reading, you know, so, you know, you have been stuffed full of God's goodness. I go, I'm a manicotti full of God's goodness. And, and that's how God wants us to be, you know. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Um, John Eldridge talks about the river that Ezekiel describes, that it gets so wide you can't even swim across it. Mm -hmm. And everywhere the river went, there was life. Mm -hmm. That river's in us now. Yeah. If we'll let it flow. No, you can't contain it. It's exactly, it's a flow. If you try to hold it in, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But if you just let it flow, mm -hmm. it just continues and continues and continues. Then, That's how God wants it to be. Yeah. Oh, uh, we ready for a, a fantastic little paragraph in the middle of 16? Uh, uh, in the middle I, of I got a little bit more. Go okay. for it. So this is going to be a little weird, so just follow me. Just try to stay with me. No, it's not. It's not, not, it's not. <laughs> I've been digging into this trust thing. So yes. now I'm seeing all kinds of stuff here. So I'm, I'm reading this, this thing in preparation tonight, and I'm going, oh, wait a minute. Now, intellectually... Deep down, I know that Paul wasn't in Rome when he wrote Romans. But you kind of forget that mm. a lot of times because you know he went to Rome. He was in Rome for two years. And now you're reading Romans and you just, you just don't, it, it, you know, somehow it kind of filters around and that, right, at least in my head, rattles around a little bit and I just kind of forget about it. But reading this passage, I'm going, wait a minute, he's not in Rome, he's in Corinth. When did he write this? He wrote this around 55 AD, right? So then I started doing some research. I said, well, wait a minute. This is cool, because this is Paul. This is Paul. This is not like Joe Nobody in the faith. This is Paul, right? Okay? And he says, I'm planning to go to Spain, and I'm going to stop in Rome, and I'm going to visit with you guys for a while, and I'm going to go to Spain. I'm making plans. I'm making plans. Mm. God has other plans. Okay? Yeah. So what happened? So this was, <clears throat> when, does he go to, when does he go to Rome? It's like you know, February 58 was when he started, right? It mm -hmm. took him till probably about end of May or June to get there. But somewhere in the middle of 58 is when he's in, in Rome. So this is written just about three years before he goes to Rome. Or let's say, no, wait, three years before he's arrested. Or wait, let, three years before he's dragged in chains to Rome. Yeah. yeah. After his trip to Jerusalem with his offering. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's right after that. Yeah. Because everybody on the way to Jerusalem say, "Don't go to Jerusalem." <laughs> right. right? Yeah. All the prophets are telling them not to go. Don't go there. All right. So, how does how does Paul deal? I mean, this is just I just again I, I'm not I don't it just kind of jumps up out me and goes, "Here's Paul making a plan," mm -hmm. but is it lining up with what God's plan is? Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you get mad? When God's plan supersedes yours, yeah, and I who mm. and did Paul have a right to get me? He's arrested. I mean, that was a whole different plan than I'm going to Spain and I'm going to stop off for a couple of months and then visit with you guys, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just again that was it's probably not right in the scriptures in there, but it, it was something that just kind of jumped out at me. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit started talking to me about trust and stuff like that because I'm digging into that. And, okay. That's, that's a big, uh, to me, that's a big thing. It just, mm -hmm. you know, are you going to trust in God for his plans? Mm -hmm. and, and when you make your own plans and they get interrupted by God's plans, how do you handle that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you trust even in all that? I love it when I'm reading different things and they're all overlapping. Let's see if I can find this quickly. This is a, a book I bought today from Max Lucado. 
Somewhere in your mind is a novel, your novel, your novel about your future. You don't have all the details worked out, but you've got some pretty good ideas about characters and storyline. You envision a spouse or dear friends, kids, maybe grandkids. Your story includes good health, ample income, honest love, early retirement. We've got a story all of us are working on. But just when we're ready for the manuscript to be bound and published, God exercises editorial authority. Mm. He adds a character with a surprise pregnancy. He removes the character through sudden tragedy. He reverses the order of events. The manuscript you wrote called for retirement then old age. The manuscript you are living has aging with no sign of retirement. In your story, God has, a, a, <clears throat> has you lead a long and happy life. How would you feel if he gave you the happy life but edited out the long part? And then here's the part that I've highlighted. What do you do when God edits your story? Mm -hmm. That's no small question. Indeed, it is the question. Mm -hmm. Every person knows the challenge of an edited storyline. When God edits yours, how do you react? Fear or faith? Anger or trust? Do you turn away from God or turn toward him? Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. God editing your story. And, and Paul, how did Paul handle it? Right. Uh, the rumor is the reason Nero executed him was because he had converted over half of his palace to Christianity. And he was getting scared. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, and the other thing we're talking about, the prophets saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. They saw the trouble that lie ahead. And they were offering him counsel to avoid trouble. And Paul said, no, 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 I don't care what it looks like. I know I have to go. Yeah. He knew it was his assignment to go. Right. And that that's a different kind of courage. That's to a say. that's a trust of do I trust God to get me through whatever troubles? Yeah. Right. And it's a true evangelist who gets thrown in jail and so they, you know, convert everybody in the jail. Yeah, start yeah. preaching in jail. You know, no matter what situation you're in, are you sharing the the truth with people? Yeah. No matter where you are. Well and and I I had this decision, um, in our first year of pastoring here, and there was a, a coup, for lack of a better word, and I was going to be removed. Um, and it wasn't done correctly, and there was really no reason for it. Uh, I certainly wasn't perfect. And I said, God, do I have to stay here? Or can I go back to where I came a year ago? I was a campus minister. I was an associate pastor. Life was good. They loved me in that church. Do I have to stay here? And God was pretty clear with me and said, no, Tom, you don't have to stay here. You could go back. I would bless you if you went back. And I said, okay, as long as I'm not painted into a corner, I'll stick it out. And I knew it meant trouble for me. I knew it was going to be harder to stay here and be the senior pastor at Harvest. With all the turmoil this church had been through, four pastors in eight years, it was a messed up group of people. And then they picked me. Um, it would be easier to stay where I was. But I chose the path that I knew was God's best for me, even though it was more difficult. And, and that's what you see with Paul. He's being counseled. You could avoid this trouble. Well, God would have loved him. God would have never left him or forsaken him. But I'm going to choose the thing that I believe is the obedient way, even if it means more difficulty. And that's a, an element of trust. I'm going to do the hard thing and believe that God's going to be with me in it. Mm -hmm. um, something I saw on Facebook recently is... Um, it was the three Hebrew children in the fire and Jesus is there and it said, do you need a fourth man? Mm -hmm. you know, do you mm -hmm. need the fourth man in the fire to be standing with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know all that was going to come out of this. <laughs> for 14 well, here. It's, it's rich stuff. It really is rich stuff. And Romans especially, I think the last half has really surprised me with how many nuggets, you know, hidden gems were, were planted into it. Anything else on 15 before we jump to that little paragraph? Once, twice. Okay, chapter 16, the reason we're not spending a whole week on it is it's basically just greetings with one little statement in the middle of it. And that's the statement that we're going to read. So, for the last time in this school year, <laughs> Samuel Cole. Uh, let's read chapter 16. Verses 17 through 20. Excuse me. Okay. And now I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters. 
Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. But everyone knows that you are obedient to the Lord. Ooh, this makes me very happy. I want you to be wise in doing, doing right and to stay innocent of any wrong. The God of peace will soon stop. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Mm. Awesome. Good stuff. Belching at all. They're having fun with Alice. I know. Oh, my goodness. It's all good. It's all good. You're excused, Sam. So, there's a bunch of greetings, and then what does Paul return to? Unity. Unity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Watch out for the divisions. Um, People who cause divisions and upset your faith. Um, Yeah. That also should mean. You should be watching what you're doing and what you're saying. Yes. Are, are, are things that I'm doing and things I'm saying creating division? Mm-hmm. Or am I contributing to unity? Well, like you said last week, are you causing somebody else to stray by yes. what you're teaching? Yes. Intent other. Intentional or otherwise, but yeah. Yeah, the language <laughs> of... <laughs> Not much. The language of the passion is fantastic. Now, dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to give you one final word of caution. Watch out for those who cause divisions and offenses among you. Or, to put it in, in that context we were just talking on, watch out for what causes divisions and offenses mm-hmm. among yeah. you. And again, I, I, I cannot shake this. Sometimes I don't think I do this the best. Sometimes I, I, I let my own aggravation creep into this. But we live in a divisive culture. Yes. And too many people that want power want to divide to get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because creating an enemy to fight against will unify the other side. And absolutely our politics are there right now where mm-hmm. both sides are demonizing the other and I find myself many many times going the Bible says we should pray for those in authority we should pray for them we should bless them we should bless their families the intention of God's design is that those in authority are, are granted that by God now whether they do it right or not they got to answer for it to God himself but why do we have to divide for the sake of power? Why can't we cast vision? Why can't we um, share what we're going to do, make commitments to people? I, I, I talked with a gentleman running for office and county council, and he did a pretty decent job of standing on my doorstep and articulating what he thought needed to be done in our county. And I asked him, you know, okay, you're running in a primary for a seat that's already held. Who's held? And he told me the name of the person. And I said, well, I, you know, I'm a Christian. Jesus said don't name call. <laughs> so I have a problem with some of our current politics right now. You know, I said, you know, there's a particular political leader that what's been part of his trademark is name calling people. Mm-hmm. Jesus said don't do it. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with this particular thing. Madison Avenue never obviously met Jesus. <laughs> you know, it, it's just amazing to me. Um, and again, I, 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 it's not hard on either side. In fact, I'm, I'm trying to be restrained, especially on stage on Sunday morning, to not overquote politicians who are proving to me that we need as believers to live Romans out. Mm-hmm. Humble, yeah. not knowing it all, not being elitist, not being arrogant. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, there's plenty of that to go around. So we should be watching out for those who cause division and offense. Mm-hmm. And yeah, if we want to get really humble and applicable and let Jesus teach us, is there anything in me causing division, causing offense? You know, am am I causing a problem for somebody? Or am I working hard? Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Holy Spirit. He brings unity. We just got to work to keep it. We don't have to make it. He makes it. Yeah. But we got to maintain it and not let it be torn apart. Yeah, the, the unity is really what it's about. 
Mm-hmm. Who so wants why it? aren't we Unitarians? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that word does not mean what I think you think it means. Can I do just That's a couple nice. verses from the beginning? Sure. Verses 1 through and 2 there. Uh, this is Passion. Let me introduce you our dear and beloved sister in the faith, Phoebe, a shining minister of the Church of Sedgecria. I am sending her with this letter and ask that you shower her with your hospitality when she arrives. Embrace her with honor, as is fitting for one who belongs to the Lord and is set apart for him. I am entrusting her to you, so provide her whatever she may need, for she has been a great leader and champion for many. I know, for she's been that for even me. I don't think Paul had a problem with women in the faith. <laughs> women in ministry, yeah. yeah. Women a in shiny leadership. minister. Yeah. Women in leadership. Yeah, that's awesome. That was that was all. I just went. I just I just didn't. I'm like, people talk about that a lot, and I yep. was like, I don't think Paul had a problem with it at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No, he did not. He didn't care what uniform you played in. He cared how you played the game. Yep. Yeah, people write stories to fit their own narratives, their own history. They write history to fit oh, yeah. their yeah. version of it <coughs> to make you draw this conclusion. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's one of the things about Scripture, and you see it between Jesus and the devil. By the time, you know, the temptation goes back and forth, the devil's quoting Scripture to Jesus. So people have misquoted and, and misused the Bible, yeah. you know, from the very beginning. Um, what we need to do is to be deep enough in it to see when that's happening. And again, to read with a broad thing, even if we pull a phrase out, does it resonate with the whole of what God says throughout the Bible? Yes, yes. That, that's that's, that's, how, that's how you protect yourself from people misquoting the Bible. If, if, if they're quoting something to you and they're trying to convince you of something that doesn't seem like that's God. It doesn't fit. You should take a step back and go, let me go look at that verse and pull it into the context of what it is and see what it really says. Because mm-hmm. uh, that they're, they're just using a piece of it. I think the best lies are those that are based in truth. Yeah. Those are the ones that are the hardest to, to, to discern. Yeah. Well, and, and he talks about those who cause divisions, the um, wording in the Passion Translation, is they're being driven by their own desires for a following. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, I remember reading. Uh, yeah. Or a private jet. Yeah. There's that selfish ambition again. Well, yeah. There's greed, but again, an awful lot of what drives leaders is the need for followers. Yeah. And again, you just go back to Jesus, who, you know, left the garden and everybody ran away, and he went on his mission, even if it meant submission to corrupt authority figures. Trust in the Father. So Jesus was willing to give up. Jesus had membership drives. He drove off members. When the crowd got too big, he said, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part of me. People went, vampire movie, I'm out of here. You know, that's crazy. So if, if we do what we do for the sake of a following, we will be tested. Or do we do it because it's right? God, God challenges me, and, and you know I'm a pastor, and I'm a guy. I want to I want to see our church do well. Um, if I do the right thing, God will bless it, and then it's up to people to respond. And that's how Jesus was. I mean, he he looked at the rich young ruler and loved him. The Bible says, and said, "This is the thing you lack. Your money's your idol. Sell everything you have, so you get that mess out of your life." give it to the poor, come follow me. And the guy walked away sad because Jesus put his finger on his idol. Jesus will speak truth to us even if it's harsh, but he'll love us. But he didn't tell that guy what the guy wanted to hear for the sake of his following. We need to be willing to do the same. 19 and 20. Well, in, in that verse there, that in that passion that says for, for creator following to me, it's just like what you had said earlier. The first thing flashing in my head was all the politicians nowadays right. that you hear. They're just yeah. trying to get a following. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, you know, have the balance so I don't lose too many on either side of the issue. Ridiculous. 19 and 20 from the Passion. 
I'm so happy when I think of you because everyone knows the testimony of your deep commitment of faith. Lord, let that be true of us. Mm -hmm. So I want you to become scholars of all that is good and beautiful and stay pure and innocent when it comes to evil. Mm -hmm. And the God of peace will swiftly bound, pound Satan to a pulp mm -hmm. under your feet and the wonderful favor of our Lord Jesus will surround you. Mm -hmm. And, and there was a song, we sang it years and years ago now. I thought about bringing it out for this, but I don't know if it's going to make the cut. Um, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And again, you always have to... Um, oh, there's a... Here we go. Paul proclaims the ultimate triumph of Christ and his church over evil in, every in this in fulfillment of uh, Genesis 3.15. That um, when Adam and Eve bite the fruit, and he, he gives a, a verdict on Adam, a verdict on Eve, and he says to the serpent, there will be a seed that will come from the woman, that you'll bite his heel, but he will crush your head. Um, it's, it's a prophecy that's fulfilled here. Mm -hmm. um, soon does not mean shortly, yeah. after lunch. Okay. <laughs> but swiftly in circumstances of life, as at the end of this age, we may expect God's conquest of Satan's workings to be short and sharp. Mm. And, um, yeah, that's, there's a, a bigger unpacking of that. It doesn't necessarily mean soon. It doesn't mean the way we want it. But there is no, you know, ultimate battle between good and evil. No. God and the devil are not wrestling. This is not an even match. God is, you know, in charge. Uh, God is ruling and reigning. There is no comparison. There is no one before him, no one beside him. Um, again, if you read Harold Everly, he'll challenge you and say, there's actually very little in the Bible about the devil. Yeah. We read more into it than is really there. Mm. And, and there is not a tremendous amount of explanation. The best explanation you can come up with if you deal with it at face value is we needed resistance training. We needed something to push against. We needed an opposition. And that's why the, you know, the enemy is allowed to do what he does, is, is to train us to rule and reign. Mm. And God, the God of peace, will crush Satan under our feet. Amen. Yeah. Good stuff. It's good. Well, I will miss you all over the summer. I know we'll be online, but I will miss you. Yeah, I will miss you too, lady. Well, again, we'll be there you can um, you know comment and, and we'll join in online um, or you know Sundays at 1030 here at Harvest you're so far from home I know, <laughs> I know. we don't want to pull you from home I have one question Pastor yes sir I'm not really computer and kind with phones and stuff yep and this Bible here is a little printed is just a little bit too small, small it's awfully small it? what yeah. kind of Bible do I need to get well, I, I would recommend a New Living Translation to you is, is what this translation is because it's the most accurate and clear of the Can modern I get a bigger letter? Large print. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, a large print edition. Yeah. Okay. And, and we could look at helping you with that. Yeah. Um, there might be a, a, a larger version of this. I'm in the same boat. Now I have to move Hayford's Bible till I get the right angle. <laughs> it isn't just that. Because I noticed you had it on your phone, too. Right. You can do it on your phone? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah there, there's a fantastic app on your phone called the Bible app that has a lot of different translations, reading plans, devotional stuff. Okay. Yeah. It's... I still want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and the great thing about it, if you put it on a phone or a tablet, is you can change the font size. You can make it the letters as big as you want. That's all you do doing. Yeah. So that's, that's, these are great tools. Um, this is the only paper Bible I ever use. Most of the time I'm reading and studying and building sermons electronically. So it's good tools. Well, let's pray and we'll uh, close out. Father, we say thanks for your word. It is truly alive. It does truly uh, cut between soul and spirit, as the writer of Hebrews said. And uh, God, we pray that you'll continue to examine us, challenge us, God. Call us out and... Um, Build us up. Father, what a fantastic picture that we're stuffed full of your goodness. God, let that be true of me. Let that be true of us, the, the people of Harvest. And God, let us go out into a needy world like we've talked about 
to share some of that goodness, whether it's in word or just in deed. Um, we want to be great representatives of you. And Father, I do want to pray. We've had some fantastic fellowship uh, here in this place on Wednesday nights. God, that you'll keep us strong spiritually through the summer season. Um, Lord, wherever it is that we're worshiping you, God, that we'll uh, tap into you, plug into you, and get a hold of you, especially where there's a change of routine, um, especially for those of us going away and having some rest and relaxation and vacation, God, that we won't leave you home, but we'll take you with us on those times away, God. It won't be the same. It won't be as good if we don't include you in it, Lord. And so we just say thanks again for your word, for the fellowship of your body, and uh, we look forward to your goodness stuffed into us yes. in the weeks and months to come. We say thanks for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Corinthians in the fall, second Wednesdays, the next few months, you'll find us here on Facebook.